Hello there, everybody. Welcome to episode 10 of the Retro Odyssey podcast. We've been on nine journeys so far. We've visited various different genres and systems, but now we're journeying onto the Saturn. I'm not alone, though. As always, I'm joined by Matt, Stephen, and Ryan. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? Uh, not too bad. Mm, a little tired. A little tired? Yeah. Well, we record this pretty late, so I think uh, we're all pretty much tired at this point. It's our new theme. Yeah. We'll get through it, though. So, the Saturn's my favourite console, and that's why we're covering it this episode. So, we've done a couple of console picks so far. We've done the Mega Drive, and we did the Nintendo 64. And now it's my turn for the Saturn. So, the Saturn, I never acquired one until, like, a few years back. And I basically heard some things about it that piqued my interest. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to pick one up. And... Ever since I got it, it kind of became my pride and joy. And like now I just adore it immensely. I know you guys as well have picked up like Saturns recently too. So what's your history with it? Did you know about it back in the day? Like I know it was pretty obscure pretty much everywhere. But did you know it existed? Uh, Over here in the US, the Saturn didn't do particularly great. Uh, It didn't do great as a whole, unfortunately, but it did even worse over here in the US, it seemed. But my friend did have one, and he did have a couple games for it, and we didn't really play it. We played his Genesis more than anything. It was just one of those consoles that he had, and we might have played one or two games way on back, back, way on back, and then I just forgot about it for like 10 years. Yeah. Well, it's easy to do because it kind of got killed off. I mean, Sega made loads of big mistakes, and everyone was kind of dead set against the Saturn. Like, the pissed off consumers, the pissed off retailers, the pissed off developers. And I think that, you know, most people just wanted the thing to die, apart from the people that actually had it and, you know, loved it. And I think it's kind of a shame, really. It is a shame, because uh, really, when you look at its capability, um, it was probably the strongest, um, well, I guess you look at the 32, but you had PlayStation, you had the Saturn, and the Saturn is just more capable than the PlayStation was. Yeah, it but, was designed basically as a 2D powerhouse. Mm-hmm. And then, like, they started to realize that, oh, everybody's going 3D. Shit, we'll better stick in an extra processor and make 3D possible. So it's sort of like this 2D powerhouse with just, like, a shitty little extension, like, rammed into the side of it just to give it the capability of doing 3D. So, yeah, it is like a powerful machine, but mainly for 2D, and whilst 3D is possible and, you know, you can do some great things with it, it wasn't easy to do. I mean, the system was kind of very notorious to develop for, um, you know, just anyway, and doing 3D was just so tricky that a lot of people didn't bother doing it properly. So things like transparencies were possible on the system. Like, a lot of people didn't think it was possible, but it's just because developers can't be asked doing it because it was so much effort. Well, what that did mean is it got a lot of really good Japanese shmups. <laughs> yeah. It is like the system for shmups, pretty much. I personally didn't have one growing up, and I didn't know anyone that did. But I know, like in the press, it was known as the shmup machine, the shoot up machine. And yeah. um, it wasn't until about a year ago that I actually picked one up. And my library for it is still really small, but I do have a decent chunk of games. I've, I've probably got about 10 or so, but it's definitely something that I'm adding to over time. What about you, Stephen? Well, uh, my history with the Saturn is actually pretty short and simple. I have never owned or even played a Sega Saturn. I knew it existed, but I've never actually played one. And that includes in preparation for this episode. <laughs> so I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to be quiet a lot today. Well, no, I mean, it's still, still going to be interesting to see what you think, because, you know, you, you have kind of experienced the games in terms of, you know, uh, viewing them. So yeah. it's still kind of interesting to see what you think about, you know, what it was like in terms of performance and how the games, you know kind of compared to the likes of the PlayStation and the consoles you are familiar with. Right. Right, as for like the Sega Saturn, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, bore you with like a history lesson about the Saturn. 
it's it's pretty interesting to be honest but there's loads of videos out there that you know explain everything that went on but effectively you know after the mega drive sega was like they were on a bit of a high and then they just ballsed up because they wanted to kind of extend the life of the mega drive so they released like the mega cd or sega cd or whatever 32x and all that lot and it just flopped and they actually developed the 32x basically alongside the sega saturn because america wanted 32x and then sega of japan wanted the saturn so they were kind of fighting themselves because you know they were both 32-bit machines and they were both in development at the same time and then you know they had the whole thing with the launch where they did a surprise launch and they went oh the sega saturn yeah that's out now and people were just like what (laughs) so you know they released this expensive system really because it you know it was like 400 dollars i think and it was just like out of the blue and, you know, to make things worse, you know, Bernie Stoller, who was with them at the time, basically said the Saturn is not Sega's future. And then, obviously, from that point on, all the developers thought, well, fuck the Saturn then. If it's not your future, then no point in doing anything for it. And it's a damn shame, really. I mean, as I say, the console itself is pretty great. The library is really damn good as well. I mean, Matt, you mentioned about the shmups and stuff. Yeah. Uh, the Saturn was kind of famous for like shmups, fighters, and RPGs, which really aren't my favourite genres, to say the least. Like shmups and RPGs, I kind of hate. And like fighting games, I don't hate, but I'm terrible at them. I'm terrible at shmups, but I just, I just love them. It's like one of my favourite genres. Yeah. Oh, it's not that just that I'm terrible at them. I find that the gameplay is quite obnoxious. Anyway, that's a brand for another time when we do when we do shmups eventually. But yeah, even with the three main genres it's famous for, out of the window, there's still enough of a library for me to, you know, love this system. You said you didn't want to go too deep into the history and stuff, but I would like to bring up the DRM system that it had. Yeah, that is quite an interesting thing. And it's not something that is brought by, you know, on the Saturn videos much. Well, you brought it up, so do you want to explain it? Yeah, basically on the Saturn discs, they took an actual physical approach to DRM, which is, I guess you could say is kind of a spiritual successor to the um, NES-10 lockout chip, which, go to quick, it was just a chip in the old Nintendo Entertainment System that had to verify with the console to make sure that it was an approved game or else it wouldn't get through. The yeah. way Sega's turnaround was this to make sure that games were legitimate, and it also made it very difficult for games to be ripped. Like they didn't even they weren't even ripping Saturn games like Yeah. Fifteen years ago. They they hadn't figured it out yet. It took from forever. It took them almost twenty years to break it. Yeah. It's not the easiest thing to do. It, yeah, now. it's still difficult. There's actually a physical ring on the outside edge of the disc that the Saturn reads that pit the scanner picks it up as for, from what I've done my research on. And it verifies that this is indeed a Saturn disc. It is made by, you know, it is approved by Sega. And those discs were never released. It made so no one could rip their own legitimate copies. They couldn't get proper copies. They weren't sure how to get around it. It really did make it almost impossible to pirate a game for it. Which is kind of clever, because, I mean, if you think about other physical forms of DRM... The only other one that springs to mind is like the GameCube, where they made like the tiny discs. Mm-hmm. I believe the PlayStation had something with, um, you know how they had the black discs for the PlayStation? I believe yeah. that was something that was recognized by the system. Now, I know obviously the, uh, the PlayStation could be modified to read CDRs like quite easily, but I do believe that that black disc was something that had to be bypassed in order to actually read other discs, because... It looked for a black disc. There's a certain kind of reflectivity, um, if that's the word, that it is comes, now. comes from the black discs. Yeah. Well, now here's a question. Because um, the original PlayStation could also play audio CDs. Could the Saturn do the same thing? Yes. Yes, it okay. can. You can use it as a CD player. And okay. you can actually put in the games as well and play the music like you were playing a CD. So you could use a CD player function to play the soundtrack, basically, for the games? I actually have a Saturn controller that came with the Saturn I bought earlier this year. Um, 
that has a pause, play, and skip forward, backward buttons on it. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, I think the sound controller does actually contain those labels marked on them. I'll have to check my controller, but I'm sure I've seen that on mine too. So I think it was like a standard thing. This one is a third party. It doesn't have the labels. It actually has the buttons, which is probably just redundant buttons on the controller then. But still, yeah, it's pretty neat. Mine does have some markings. I'd have to look carefully, but I can see like a skip forward and skip backwards button, which mm-hmm. is used for like the CD player. And then next to the two triggers. When I found out about the Saturn DRM, uh, I was pretty peeved because it's such a cheeky pun of the uh, yeah. Saturn's ring. The rings of Saturn is like the thing protecting it. Yeah, and it's just like, ah, you you assholes. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not that mad because it was a really solid, you know, it was a really good idea. Yeah, definitely. Which is kind of weird, really, because they went from that to the Dreamcast where there was basically no protection. There was nothing. And, and, like, now, you don't even have to do anything. You don't have to mod the Dreamcast or anything. You just burn a CD, stick it in, it's fine. <laughs> Bless them. Right. So, anyway, I hope everyone's ready. Let's uh, sit back and I'll navigate you to our first game that we're going to cover. So the first game we're going to look at is Puzzle and Action Treasure Hunt, which is known as Sekundo Arakotoa Sandoaru in Japan. Bravo. I, I say it's known as that. Uh, that's what I call it, and I think that's the pronunciation. And if it's not, then I apologize to any Japanese listeners that are listening to this. But that's just what I say, and it'll do for now. So, yeah, it was an, a Japanese exclusive for the Saturn in 1996, but there was a release on the Sega Titan video arcade in America, which is where that American name Treasure Hunt comes in. So... The game is weird. I mean, it's got like a kind of a pseudo story where you take down a series of bad guys and you use like mini games as weapons, I suppose. I mean, I say they're mini games, but they're not like Mario Party or anything like that. They're really kind of short and fast. And it's like something that you would find from the WarioWare series, apart from obviously this game came out like way before. And the difficulty is kind of more about working out what to do than actually doing it. So, yeah. What did you guys think about this? This game is very Japanese. Is <laughs> very, very. <laughs> A little bit. It is very... It's. I was trying to emulate... Shame on me, but, you know... Heresy. I was trying to emulate these games, but uh, the Abuse emulator is, as the name stands for, yet another buggy, unfinished Saturn emulator. It is very unstable and i wasn't able to get much past like into the demo of the game like just the startup and the whole emulator would crash it was a pretty bad time but what i was getting from the vibe when i was going watching finding videos on it was that it reminded me of one of those bizarre japanese variety tv shows well i don't know if you recognize the art style but i'm pretty sure that they're using the same art style or they might even use the same assets really of Bonanza Brothers. Yeah, yeah, it does kind of look like that, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't know if there's any kind of connection between the two, but they certainly look very similar. And it has that kind of same kind of feeling as well, because Bonanza Brothers is very kind of silly and over the top and, you know, a bit goofy. And that's what this is all about. You know, like when you beat one of the bad guys, you do just whips out like this huge hammer and flattens him. <laughs> And then just carries on walking past. So, yeah, anyway, what mini games did you experience? I mean, for you guys over in the US, it was a visual experience. But, yeah, which ones did you see? Or, you know, in the case of you, Matt, which ones did you play? And what did you think about them? Well, the first one that I played really confused me. It's all these fish going around on a screen. Then yeah, the you showed me you've, this. You've got to pick one, and it's like, what am I picking? Which one do I need to pick? Because they're just moving around the screen. And it turns out you need to pick the one that's flying in front of all the others. I say flying, I mean swimming. And they go in and out of each other. 
basically there's one that will always be above all the other ones when they're going through and you've got to try and work out which one that is and then pick that one but that took me a good while to work out exactly what i needed to do that was the only one i think that really confused me most of the other ones were more or less straightforward and that was um, your first one as well, wasn't that it? That was that was the very first one that I came across. You showed me that, yeah. and I was thinking, I've not actually seen this one. And I have to say that that, you know, is definitely the hardest one to figure out. Because I think when you showed me, I worked it out the same time you worked out as well. And it was like, oh, okay, I get it. I only worked it out when you told me what it was. Oh, right, okay. I, I can't remember if you worked out the same time or whether it was because I told you. No. But, no. yeah, it's definitely the most obscure. But the rest, you can kind of figure out what to do based on, you know, the button prompts or just, you know, messing around. Yeah, the other ones are more or less straightforward. And there's a lot of really, I mean, some of these are, like, completely stupid. But they are still fun. Yeah, one of them like the has... one where you've got to rub your back with the yeah. towel, yeah, and then some... you just burst into flames. For some reason, you're Bruce Lee, because you can't try and say that's not meant to be Bruce Lee, because it looks exactly like him. And you're just rubbing your towel back and forth until your body turns red. And the person who does it faster, could be because the CPU is doing it as well, wins the game. And there's another one. It's like a super, super dramatic kind of like look to it. And you've got like press your button really fast. All it is is taking the lid off a jar, but the way it's presented is yeah. like as this hyper dramatic kind of thing, which um, again is just is just so stupid. But it's a lot of fun. And yeah, and it, there's another one where you have to save people from a burning building. Have I you didn't like that, that one. I couldn't get my hammer to line up. You've got to line up perfectly. To, you get a hammer and you've got to knock out the. The flaming floors of the building? Yeah, and that somehow saves the people inside it. I don't quite know how. By completely obliterating part of the building, you save people inside it. Yeah. But it is difficult to actually get your timing right on that. It is. I kind of feel like when you watch it and you try and time it, I always mess up. So I kind of just get the feeling for it, and once I've got one done, I kind of get them all done. Mm. There's a... Uh couple of the games i think i caught most of them the bruce lee there are a lot of towel them. rub was just i didn't know what was going on but it was hilarious most of these games are hilarious because they're just so odd but the uh apparently having to shoot a stake in half between two dogs yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh it would seem that you had like you're shooting the stake in half and i'm assuming whoever gets the larger half is the winner I gotta have to. There's a lot of guessing here because I didn't actually get to win or lose. And uh, what you need I think to you've do just got to um, split it so the dogs can share. Yeah, I think it's lions actually, isn't it? Is it lions? I thought it was dogs. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I may be misremembering. And then there's the western uh, the shoot, yeah, shooting the coin, and it's like, okay, so this is nothing. This is whatever. And then when you <laughs> when he catches the coin at the bottom, and just the big thumbs up. I completely lost it. I There's a wonderful one. chance of the game. It's just such a wild ride. But this actually turned into one of my um, favorite games that I own on Saturn. As ridiculous oh, and, and, and stupid as it is. It's just, as you said, it's got a lot of charm to it. And it's a lot of fun. It's something that you can play in quick bursts whilst also having kind of like a progression system with the different modes of play because you do have that story mode. And you also have a mode where you can just go into the mini games as normal. So yeah. there are kind of like a lot of different ways that you can play it. And there's like, um, did you try the RPG mode? I did. For I the life like of it. me, I can't figure out what the hell is different with it. It's got some things like you buy stuff from the shop, but I don't really get the point of it. Yeah, you keep getting these items and I'm sure they have some kind of use, but I can't work out what that use is really for, it just, for yeah it just seems items. like you're doing the same as the story mode but well the arcade mode rather but with just some tweaks but it doesn't really seem to make any difference you're still doing basically the same thing yeah and i mean it just adds to those items i think the rpg mode but with none yeah. of us speaking japanese we don't quite know what those items are yeah definitely i always play the arcade mode 
Did you take down any of the bosses? How far did you actually get with it? I took down the second boss. I don't think I got to the third. Yeah, I think there are only three bosses in the game, if I remember rightly. I think there are three worlds. So I wasn't that far off then? No, I don't think you were. There might be four, but three seems to ring a bell. But it's one of those games where, you know, it's not really important how many worlds it has because all the mini games are randomized anyway so you just play mini games until the game says well done you finished mm. but you can play in two player as well which is cool so you can do the mini games together and compete against each other for who's the best yeah i just played it solo but i do have two sound pads now i got a second sound pad this week actually so next time i've got someone over i'll fire it up and give that a go yeah because i kind of think it's it is kind of like WarioWare where, you know, you can play with a friend and just have such a good time. And the great thing about it is the game is one of the cheapest Saturn games. Uh, how much did you pay for your copy? Was it like five quid or something? I think with shipping it was like six. Yeah, so it's still pretty cheap. I mean, I think mine was like three or four euros or something and I think I had free shipping. But even then, you know, for the sake of a fiver... It's something that you really need to add to your collection. As long as you've got the you know, the import adapter so you can play Japanese games, that's the only real kind of gatekeeper. I think the game's definitely worth getting. Even as expensive as the games go over here for a Saturn game, it's only, I think, the found it's anywhere between uh, 16 and 26 bucks. But I don't really? have the adapter, so any game Even I get from right Japan? now is... I'm not sure Did you check ship- shipping from Japan? I think shipping from Japan, it'll be like $5 or something. I don't think it'll be that much because it never got released in the U.S. So it never got released in the U.S. You're buying from so. Japan anyway, so I can't imagine it's going to be that much different. No, probably not, but the uh, I didn't have my 4-in-1, so I didn't have my cart to you know get rid of the region lock. Everything is going to be automatically increased to... Uh, f- everything's going up by like 40 bucks. Yeah. So... <laughs> Well, the thing is, that 4-in-1 adapter is pretty much a must-have. I mean, I didn't mention yeah. it in the, the intro, but there's a 4-in-1 adapter, which gives you extra RAM. It, you've got backup saves and things like that. It's got a cheap function, too. But most importantly, it makes it region-free, so you can play games from, like, you know, the US, PAL, or Japan. And it's such a good thing to have because... Japan had loads of exclusive titles which never saw release in the West. But also there's some games which are just cheaper to buy in Japan. And the games are in English, so there's no reason not to get it. I mean, there's a game that got released in PAL territories only in the West called Deep Fear, which was basically like an underwater Resident Evil. And the game's like, I think it's 200 and something, maybe 250 now. Yeah, but yeah, you buy from Japan and it's like ten quid or something. Ten, yeah, fifteen I paid quid. Sixteen for a copy of Japanese Deep Fear. Yeah, so for the sake of like what two hundred and thirty quid cheaper, you can get the Japanese version, and it's pretty much entirely in English anyway, apart from like a few unnecessary things. So that adapter is, you know, a definite must-have for any Saturn owner. Am I right in thinking that the region hack wasn't actually intended? It sounds like something that kind of happened by accident. For the 4-in-1? Yes. Uh, No, it was intentional, but it wasn't made by Sega. I think it's Daytel or something like that. Yes, it's it's an action replay, so it'll be Daytel. Yeah, so it's an unofficial thing as well. And I think that most of Daytel's action replay things back in the day could allow you to play foreign games i think most of them did anyway so i think it probably was intentional this particular cartridge is so essential for saturn owners that from what i can tell they are still manufacturing it the one that i bought was like brand new sealed and they had like loads on the site yeah i think they are still manufacturing it i'm not sure but yeah it's one of those things that anyone that has a sega saturn will pretty much get it just because it is pretty much an essential but yeah i'm not really sure what the original intention was but i think it was just something they released and it maybe unintentionally got big you know really big because of how the saturn panned out i don't yeah. know so yeah 
puzzle action. I think we all pretty much agree that it's a pretty decent game, yeah? Some silly fun. Yeah. Stephen, did you see any video of it? What did you think of it? I'll be completely honest here. I had set aside some time to go through this one and completely forgot about it. So I didn't get anything aside from a basic description of, you know, it's minigame based and a few of the things you guys have already covered. All ah, right. But yeah, it's one of those games that when you do get around to getting your Saturn, you should definitely pick up because if you like, you know, WarioWare or whatever, it's definitely a fun time. Yeah, I'll definitely think about it. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's wrap this game up and we're going to move on to the next pick. So we'll take a little musical interlude and I'll see you after the jump. Okay, so the next game we're going to look at is Panzer Dragoon. It was actually a release game for the Saturn and was developed by Team Andromeda. So this game's and its sequels were basically the flagship titles for the Saturn. You got Panzer Dragoon, Panzer Dragoon's Fight, and then later Saga, which, well, that was actually an RPG and not a railgun. But the first game actually got a release on the PC as well. And if you have Panzer Dragoon Auto, which got released on the Xbox, you can play the original on that too. So anyway, as I you know, briefly mentioned before, the game's a real shooter, and it's you know very similar to something like Space Harrier or Star Fox. And it follows a hunter who has to help the solo wing dragon chase the evil dark dragon and stop it from reactivating an ancient ruin. And, well, I suppose fucking shit up. So, like, the main thing that sets this game apart from the likes of, say, Star Fox is that you've actually got a 360-degree view, so you have to take down enemies from all around and not just in front. You know, it's a simple difference, but I think that it's something that helped make this game stand out a little bit from the pack and differentiate itself from other rail shooters. So, what did you think of it? First of all, what did you make of the story? I couldn't make anything of the story because I have the Japanese version and the game starts with a really super long cutscene that has a fair bit of dialogue in it and I have no idea what they're actually saying. You can pick up some things from the visuals, yeah, but not a hell of a lot. I mean, this guy is kind of like being attacked by something and he's saved by a guy on a dragon, I think, and... Then the guy on the dragon gets killed, so he takes the mm-hmm. dragon. But I have no idea what's going on, to be honest. Don't worry, because playing the English version doesn't help. Oh, right. <laughs> like, what I found is I played Panzer Dragoon and Panzer Dragoon's Vi, and I kind of experienced the world in terms of like what it looks like and what the enemies and the creatures and everything look like, and kind of got a gist of the environment but in terms of the story it was just stuff happened yeah. and then stuff stopped happening because of me shooting it <laughs> and really the game didn't really develop in terms of story until saga because saga actually kind of covers the events of the original game and zvi and actually helps put things into context and you kind of realize what happens through playing Saga. But until I played Saga, I had no clue what the hell was going on in the first or the second game. And I'm glad it's not just me, because I thought maybe I'm just an idiot and I'm not picking up the story. The first playthrough I went and watched was Japanese and I went and hunted down an English playthrough and it didn't help. Yeah. At all. It's literally, it's, like I said, it was just like, oh shit, it's all going down, and now there's a dragon, and now you're shooting things. Things are happening. Yeah, and now and let the madness commence. Yeah. Well, um, basically, like, this dark dragon is... I won't really spoil, like, the details of it, but, you know, the dragons are quite intelligent creatures, and this mm-hmm. dragon has its own agenda, and the soloing dragon is pretty much the hero of the story, and you're just 
kind of there helping to guide it round, and you're just assisting the dragon, who's like the real hero. And like the dragon is sort of like the chosen one, I suppose. I actually got to, well, attempt to play. It was really chunky, but I did get like a little bit into the first level before the abuse uh, crashed for like the thirtieth time. I've never hard closed a program so much, but the one thing I'm kind of glad that I I'm yeah I'm glad it was just like it's not going to work because I would have had a really chunky gameplay and it would have been infuriating. Especially since I will say the 360 degree shooting, while it is cool as hell, it is a little bit disorienting at first because there's a lot going on suddenly. It is. It's one of those things that you kind of have to learn to, you know, look at your map more than mm-hmm. looking at the screen. And then once you kind of learn to do that, you can then navigate yourself accordingly. Mm-hmm. If you're just kind of spinning around in circles trying to find stuff, it gets really hectic. But what I was able to do, I appreciated, was watching it, is I got to take it a lot of the level and, um, like, creature design. And honestly, even though it's a bit rough, because, like we mentioned before, the Saturn wasn't purpose-built as a 3D machine like the N64 was, the character design and the creature and world design is, honestly, for what they were working with, fantastic. I love it. Yeah, and you've got to bear in mind as well, this was a launch title. Mm-hmm. And people say that this game can look a little bit rough, but I think to say this got released on launch, it looks fantastic. Like, especially when you compare it to, like, the other games that came out on launch. Like, you got, uh, I think Sega Rally came out on launch, and oh, I can't remember what else it was, like, Virtual Fighter, I think. And both of those were kind of, like, shitty versions so much so they had to release, like, a second version on the Saturn, saying, like, this is what we originally meant to do. Virtua but, Fighter, good. Not two, Virtua Fighter, good. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, there's basically, I think it was Virtua Fighter Remix, it was called. Um, but, yeah, anyway, like, Panzer Dragoon just didn't need that because it was just already great. I mean, the levels as well, I kind of think... Uh, quite exciting in terms of themes like you've got the first level that's like this big wide open ocean and Mm -hmm. you've got all these monuments and stuff that you're weaving in and out of and the second level you've got like these sand dunes where like the you know the big worms and stuff are going up and down through the dunes and chasing you which reminded me of um what i saw well, not Dune. Well, a little bit of Dune, but it honestly reminded me of um, Star Fox 64. I'm trying to remember what the the desert planet is. It's one of the two tank levels you can take. Oh, yeah. I think I know which one you mean. I don't remember the name of it either, but yeah, I know what you mean. But yeah, basically just cruising through the desert and there's all sorts of like wildlife and shit. Yeah. And of course, they're all horrible monsters, but you know, that's fine. That's, so that's to be what, expected. Yeah, immediately. That's what I was... That reminded me of it, only... Um, Instead of a tank, you're on a dragon, and you know what? That's uh, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Visually, it is quite a striking game. I think it is helped by the color palette as well, because it has yeah. fairly muted colors. And for a game with a lot going on, if it's like too bright, too colorful, you're going to have trouble following what's going on. But having a more muted color palette, not only does it make it easier to tell what's going on but it kind of gives it a more realistic kind of look as opposed to a cartoony look and i think that kind of like helps in the world that they've built yeah definitely i think everything is pretty much really well designed you know they did do a good job one thing that i didn't like so much is did you beat the game matt i beat the game on easy mode easy which, uh, we, which which is only four levels. Yeah. So that's the issue. There's no beating the game on easy mode. Because you beat the game on easy mode, and it says to be continued. Yeah. Because there's effectively a wall at the end of each difficulty mode. So even if you play on normal, you can't see it through to the end of the game. What you have to do is you have to play the hardest difficulty in order to see the story through to the end. And honestly, that is bullshit. I couldn't get very far on normal difficulty. I had to switch it down to easy. Yeah. I mean, the good thing is the second game does away with all that, so you don't have to worry about stupid, 
difficulty barriers because, you know, you can actually play the game and get through to the end and be like, oh, fair enough. But this one, you're forced to play on hard. And that's the only way you can see it through to the end. Personally, what I did on my first playthrough is I beat the game on easy. Then I did the level select to access the normal difficulty for levels five and six, I think it is. Yeah. And then I did the level select to do the rest. So it was just like, I'm not playing your games and doing these levels all again. I'll just start from the levels I didn't do. The action replay also has an invincibility mode as well. Yeah. But, you know, I think that if you have to resort to invincibility just to see a game through to the end, it kind of ruins the point of it. Yeah, I mean, I guess that is dependent on skill, really. Yeah. But, as you say, kind of like locking levels behind, the difficulty is a bit crap. I mean, it can be done in a decent way. I mean, we covered Wiz and Liz, which did a similar kind of thing a few months back. And I think that did it well because... It doesn't feel like you're missing out. No, because... Like, you get through to the end, and even though you get more, by playing the harder difficulty, you don't feel like, you know, you haven't reached the end. Hmm. Reverting back to Star Fox, Star Fox did that for a while, too, where they had, like, you had to take the hard path. But yeah, but it's the true ending, but you do get an ending. It doesn't just say, to be continued, if you want to continue the fight against Andros, you're going to have to... And as I said, they did resolve that in the second one. And the second one is definitely a lot better in terms of the content it offers and actually making it more accessible to people. And it's a real shame that the first game does that because it feels like they're just artificially increasing the game's length by making you replay it on the hardest difficulty. Yeah. Yeah, as I say, it does help having, you know, inbuilt level select where you can basically access the levels that you need to you need to play to progress the story. But oh, I don't um, think you should do that. There is actually you know there was another game, a newer game that did that was Cuphead. And it kinda of pissed me off a little bit, but also I really liked the game, so I I was able to go back and uh But saying that with Cuphead it. It wasn't the hard difficulty. It was was it normal? It was you had, you, had, normal. you had to beat every single level. Well, I guess you had to beat every single boss on at least normal difficulty. Yeah. So you had to, or do else you, normal. or else you couldn't fight the final I, boss. I, I, was it the final boss, or was it just King Dice? Or well, it was the, King was Dice. The last two? Yeah, it was King, King Dice. Dice go, but then it led to the final boss. Yeah, you'd go to King Dice, and he'd be like, "Man, you didn't get these contract rights. Get out of here." And go get, and go do your job. Yeah. I and mean, it was like, hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was bullshit in that, too. That's never a good thing to do. Because, like, but Cuphead's hard. At least hard you could play more than four levels. Yeah. But it's just like, yeah, it's, it's already hard enough. You don't need to make it harder on me. Yeah. So, and you pull but, stuff like that. It is yeah. a bit irritating. But with Panzer Dragoon, I mean, mechanically, it is still a really fun game to play. I mean, like you said, you have the rail shooter aspect, so you're not having to kind of like steer too much. I mean, there's a little bit. But yeah. um, the full 360 movement, well, it, it's not so much movement. You just look in different directions and fire in those yeah, directions. You're moving in like 90 degree angles. Yeah, it helps to make the fights more dynamic and exciting than similar kind of on rail shooters, something like Space Harry, for example. Yeah. And there are other kind of like friendly pilots as well it just makes it seem like you're taking part in this large scale war yeah you know and being able to see like everything going on around you in this 360 view it just makes it a lot more epic definitely yeah i mean mean, even more so in the second game um where they kind of they really play on that epic scale the impression i got from it from what i saw was basically that it was star fox but better because there was more there and more of a story and everything. So I kind of I agree with everything you were saying. The camps between Star Fox and Panzer Dragoon, if you go on to like, read message boards, it's like, oh, Star Fox better. Like, it's very polarized. You don't often get people who are like, I like them equally. 
The only thing I saw close to that was between Panzer Dragoon and Star Fox. My favorite of the two is Sin and Punishment. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that's pretty fair. Sin and Punishment is excellent. Yeah. But to be fair, I kind of don't see why there should be debates. Because both are great games. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, rail shooters now, it's basically a dead genre. So I think that people should appreciate and be happy about, you know, all the good ones that exist. And, you know, Star Fox is great, and so is Panzer Dragoon. As a whole series, I think that the Panzer Dragoon games hold up better because Star Fox is a bit up and down in terms of quality. Uh -huh. But, you know, comparing, like, Star Fox 64 with Panzer Dragoon 1, for example, I would say that... They're both really good, solid games. Both have their advantages and disadvantages, but I would say it's acceptable to enjoy both of them. Oh, definitely. I mean, one of the appeals to me with Star Fox was the sci-fi kind of setting, but I'm also a big fantasy fan, so having essentially that kind of gameplay expanded and in a fantasy setting, yeah. it's, you know, it's just more for me to enjoy. Yeah, see, you're not losing here. Yeah, I can still go play both games. Yeah, definitely, because, I mean, it's, uh, you know, as you say, one's sci-fi, one's fantasy, so it depends on what kind of mood you're in or, what you know, which one you prefer. Yeah. I've personally never played Star Fox 64. I've only oh, played the uh, the first one on the SNES, and I really? do prefer Panzer Dragoon to the, to the original the Star Fox game that I've played. You'll have to play Star Fox 64. I think it's I think uh, I think on our list somewhere. Hmm. Pretty sure it's on our uh, future to do is. list. 64? Yeah. yeah, it is. Somewhere. Hopefully, Sin yeah. and Punishment's on there too, since we're talking about rail shooters a little bit. Uh, I think Sin and Punishment is in the rail shooter episode. Probably with Star Fox 64. Hopefully, we get there one day. Oh, yeah. All being well. Um, but yeah, Panzer Dragoon, I really dig it. Most people. You know, that like the Panzer Dragoon series, say that Zvi is better, the second one. And mechanically, it is. Zvi kind of takes the mechanics and just makes them a lot more solid. It also adds in like a berserk meter where you can, you know, overload your dragon and just fire like shots which wipes out everything. And you can also evolve your dragon. Like it starts out and you've got a dragon that doesn't even have wings. And it's just running against the ground. And then it grows and becomes bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. And it has different evolution paths depending on how you play the game. So the game's quite interesting in that regard. And it's a lot deeper mechanically. But for me, I just think that the world in the first one is better. And the set pieces are more exciting. Like, as I say, you know, from the, you know, the open world of the first level to the sand dunes, and, like, there's, you know, there's a section where you're going through, like, these corridors, and it's in a cave or something like that, and you're flying through these tunnels really fast. I just think the first one just feels more epic. Yeah, those sandworms as well, I think that was, for me, the most striking point of the levels that I played, just having those yeah. rise up and you just having to kind of like lock on and shoot the bodies as they rise up. Yeah. And, oh yeah, one thing we didn't touch upon, the music. I mean, we didn't touch upon it for puzzle action because it's got like one music track. But the music in this game is pretty good. Especially the title theme. Oh now, yeah, for absolutely. me, like the title theme, I could listen to that all day. No, I also very much enjoyed it because it's not like... Um... I guess we're making a lot of we're pulling a lot of comparison here. The um, Star Fox games have like really upbeat music for the most part. Yeah, and I would not call Panzer Dragoon music. I, I didn't hear all of it, but it's not particularly upbeat. But it's fitting, and it's. I think it's epic. It gives there helps you go. give that epic fantasy feel. It has the same effect, I think, as the menu music for um, Dragon's Dogma, where you had that really, really good piece of music to kind of set up your expectations for the game. Yeah, definitely. But that is a um, pretty good comparison, actually. 
which is also a good fantasy game. It's fantastic. It's just a shame we can't do it for this. Yeah, it's a little bit too modern. But it's still definitely uh, a recommendation to anyone that sees it on the cheap. Oh, absolutely. Right, so uh, Panzer Dragoon then. You all thought it was a pretty solid shooter? Yeah. Yeah, like I'm definitely interested in uh, checking it out for myself. I'm going to pick up the Xbox version. Yeah, like I actually didn't watch very far in because I wanted to experience Experience it myself. Well, from what I've heard, Auto is actually very good. But I've never played it myself. It's the only Panzer Dragoon game I've not played. From what I've been reading, I was looking at um, Orta, and supposedly it is a um, OG Xbox game. Yeah, it but is backwards it, compatible though. But it runs flawlessly on the 360, apparently. Oh, okay, cool. So you don't have to have a big clunky Xbox to play. You can just pop it on your 360. Well, that's that's handy. I mean, I do have the original Xbox, but... Yeah, but we all know that even the slimmed-down controller on that thing was garbage. Yeah, the yeah. controller for the original Xbox wasn't the best. No. I'm still I'm still going to get that Duke. I can't remember who um, remade it, but I'm going to pick one up Duke. here. Ah, the Duke. I'm, I'm so made... excited about the Duke on Xbox One. I know. It's, it's out. You can get it, but I'm going to pick one up, and I don't know why. Yeah, well, <laughs> gotta, I've got to buy it first. Yeah, so. I've got to have the money for it. Yeah, just right. for shits and giggles. Well, I can just keep that on the desk, and if I'm playing games with someone, I can reach over and grab and kill them with it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, pick up Alter and play through it. I think you'll like it quite a lot. If you like real shooters like Star Fox, then I think there's a lot to enjoy. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check it out. I'm very interested. Cool. And as well, once you get your Saturn, I would recommend picking up uh, Zvi. Probably the oh. Japanese version will be cheaper. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm definitely going to check out the rest of this series. I just... Well. Uh, Good luck with Saga. I didn't yeah, know. Well. I could I could have played Panzer oh. Dragoon. Uh, it looks like Orta is on um, Xbox One X backwards compatibility. It is. Really? Yeah. Huh. I mean, I guess it has the enhancement to clean it up a lot. Is yes. that is Xbox One X com- backwards compatibility download or is it physical? Um, I'm looking to see I don't if know how the. It works. Um, well, the way it works is, I think any game that is on or has backwards compatibility for the one or for the you know for the Xbox One is also on the digital store. I could be wrong about that. I think so. So you might be able to get it digitally. So that I could, and probably it, cheaper. And yeah, a lot cheaper. And if I had oh, known no. that, I would have just dropped the money because the game is Orta is actually a little expensive <laughs> if you want it in the case. Forty five dollars. That's a little cheap. It's not cheap. I saw one where it's like disc only twenty bucks. It's like wow. Yeah, I would say forty five is not too bad because that's how much you'd pay for. Just the original game. I was saying, technically, you're, you're, getting, and technically you're getting two games there. Well, yeah. But neither of which are very long, so... Swings and roundabouts, I guess. Speaking of which, you know, we did mention the price for the other game, which was like a fiver. This one's a little bit more expensive. I think it generally goes for around, like, 30 quid for the PAL version. Um, I'm not sure how much the American version goes for. I mean, it's, it's one of those games that's not cheap, it's absurd, but it's not expensive. very expensive either. It's like one of those middling Saturn titles. Well, I got the Japanese version, and I paid, just looking through my eBay history, uh, £12.53. Okay, so the Japanese version's very affordable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you don't get the English subtitles, but... But as, as you said... If the you story's help, incomprehensible anyway. Yeah. anyway. Exactly, so it doesn't matter. All right, nice one. So let's wrap that up and we'll move on to the next one. So far, I'm two for two. Two games and two crackers. Let's see what the next one holds. (laughs) 
Okay, so the next game is one of my favourite games on the system. Uh, I'm pretty much sure, though, that this is a title that at least one or two of you might not like. This title is Mega Man 8, or as it's known in Japan, Rockman 8. So Mega Man 8, as you're probably aware, it was developed by Capcom. It was originally released in Japan on the PlayStation, which I think was at the back end of 1996. And then in the other regions and at the Saturn, like start of 1997, sounds about right. Yeah, the interesting thing is that Sony actually turned down the game for North America. They didn't want it because they didn't want 2D games on the PlayStation. And then basically Sega went, yeah, we'll have a Mega Man, of course we will. And then Sony went, well, actually... Okay, come back. Well, and it's funny we, because we can have you. And it's funny because you say they didn't want two D games, but the Sega wasn't good at three D, or at least full three D. It wasn't. It didn't have the power to do it. Yeah. So all your three D models were like really chunky, but all the two D games on oh, this they're beautiful. Like you, I mean. Symphony of the Night was obviously on Saturn and PlayStation, and it's beautiful on both of them. The thing is, though, with Symphony of the Night, is that that game wasn't 2D. It's, not, it's, it's technically a 3D game. Because as we covered in that one, it's technically 3D, because they made, like, 3D models, but made it look 2D. So oh, they that... textured them with, like, 2D sprites. Yeah, and so it's that brilliant. Mechanically, the game's 3D. So that's, because and, that's and that's why, and that's why it moves so smoothly. Yeah, because the PlayStation is designed for 3D, so um, weirdly making had, it more complicated is actually then you, easier. Then you had um, games like uh, Gradius Gaiden, yeah, where it said, you know, it's a Gradius game, but it's just stunningly beautiful because of the amount of power they could put into um, into it. Yeah, to, just to making it run smoothly and having these big, beautiful sprites. So I just find it humorous. They're like, no, nah, 3D games, but it's like you had the well, power to do this. I think Sony basically kind of changed their stance partway through. I think when they initially released the PlayStation, they wanted it to be like 3D and 3D and like, you know, we don't want any of that 2D garbage. That's last generation. We're all about 3D now. And then I think Sony was pretentious. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Who'd have thought? Thank you. Um, But yeah, I think they kind of realized that the demand was there and, you know, when the competitors are doing it as well, they kind of think, okay, we'll have both of them. We don't want lots of them, though. Oh, fine, Dad. Yeah. So what's strange about Mega Man 8 anyway is that they accepted Mega Man 8, but on the condition that their version had exclusive content, so it wasn't the same as the Saturn version. But what actually happened was the PlayStation version actually had content removed, and then one of the music tracks was replaced. But, like, the music track that got replaced is actually a shittier version, which doesn't sound anywhere near as good. Like, the Saturn version is the one that we had for the lead-up to this game, and it just sounds way better than the, the one that was on the PlayStation one. So the only real bonus the PlayStation version had was like a 12-page booklet that came with the game, which, (laughs) you know, the booklet is quite good, but it's a physical thing. It's not actually the game itself. The actual game itself is actually quite inferior because it's, you know, as I say, like one of the music tracks was bollocked up and then they removed content. So, yeah, it was weird. And the PlayStation version as well, from what I can tell, also has like input lag. I mean, it's not major input lag, and it's not something that's noticeable, you know, for the most part. But there are some parts of the game which I'll cover later where it does make a difference. Well, it's a Mega Man game. Any input lag is unacceptable. And I can tell you exactly, you can get into it now, but I know the uh, ice board where you're sliding down the hill, that's where you feel it. Yeah, definitely. Because I've never played the Saturn version of Mega Man 8, but I have played it on the Mega Man Collection... And well, also the Mega Man anniversary. Because, like, on, on the Game Saturn Cube. version, second time I did that snowboarding level in Frostman stage, second time, did it. No problem. Then I played the Switch version on the Legacy Collection, and it was like, what the hell is this? And as I say, 
it only seems like the input lag is very minor, but it exists. But when uh, you're on split second, I mean, that'd be like putting a, I mean, imagine putting like a fifth of a second uh, latency on Battletoads. Yeah. The game would become unplayable. <laughs> I mean, I imagine it's something you get used to, like, I mean, for the most part, I think it was only the snowboarding sections I struggled with mm-hmm. on the Switch version. The rest of it was fine and I got used to it, but it's there. And the strange thing is, whenever they do re-releases, they always use a PlayStation version, and I have absolutely no idea why. Because the Saturn version runs perfectly. It's got all the extra content and stuff. So, like, Saturn has, like, the true exclusive of that game because they just keep using the PlayStation version for re-releases. Well, it, it may, again, just roll back it makes to... No um, sense. It may roll back to they can't run the Saturn version because they'd essentially have to emulate the Saturn to make it work properly. Yeah, possibly. Maybe it's to do with the Saturn's coding, but... I can't imagine it was that complicated to make because the other chip was mainly for 3D games. So mm-hmm. I imagine for 2D games it was, you know, a lot more straightforward. But you know, I don't know. I'm not a developer, well, so maybe the other it was thought I've had along those lines was it might be a legal thing where yeah, you know, Sega, where they signed a thing with Sega that says this content will be exclusive forever and ever. Amen. Yeah, but honestly. Like, you look at Sega these days, and I don't think Sega would give a shit. I think if they said to Sega, can we use a Saturn version, they'd be like, yeah, sure. Just make sure you put, like, in trailers and stuff that you're using the superior Saturn version, just so we get some good press and do what you like. Yeah, I mean, that, that would make total sense, but these are video game companies we're talking about. Yeah, I'd say that I'd, I couldn't imagine Sega doing something like that, though, because... They just stick their stuff on everything, and they don't really care these days because they don't have hardware. And they don't really have anything left. Well, exactly, so for them, it don't really matter. It's probably something we'll never figure out. They're trying yeah. their best to murder Sonic. Well, uh, you say... They've already succeeded, my friend. You say that, but Sonic's weird these days because they release, like, two games at the same time. You've got Sonic Mania and Sonic Forces. Sonic Mania is a masterpiece, and then Sonic Forces is a game. <laughs> have, have we discussed that that bit? Because there is that interesting thing about uh, Mania. That was so polite of you. Well, the thing is, like, I haven't actually played Sonic Forces until now. I picked it up like on the um, the Thanksgiving sale, you know, for Black Friday, and I picked it up and I started playing it, and I thought it's not terrible. It's just there. But yeah, anyway, we're going a little bit off topic here. I don't think Sega would really care, but this game, anyway, it's a Mega Man game. You know, you've got eight bosses, you've got special weapons that you get from defeating bosses, lots of platforming, and then at the end there's a Wily Castle. You know, the game does have a story, which is, you know, not normal in Mega Man games, but to be honest, it's not really important. So, what did you guys make of Mega Man then? Like you guys, Stephen Ryan, you've played this game before, right? Yes. Nope. Oh, no, I haven't. have. Nope, this is the first time I touched it, even though even though I have the anniversary collection, this was the first time I'd actually played this one. Really? Yeah. Is there any reason why you didn't touch it before, or you just... Just hadn't gotten to it. All right, okay. Because I know you're not a fan of the classic series. Nope, and that's largely why I haven't gotten to it. <laughs> Fair enough. It's been low on your list of priorities. Honesty, yeah. what a quality. So, what is it about the classic series you don't like? Before th- we move th- on to like Mega Man 8, because I'm interested to hear. I think my biggest beef with the Mega Man classic series, and it, it's weird because I love the X-Series so much, but I cannot stay in the original. I think it's because they're more platform-based, and the X-Series are more action-oriented. So, I, I think I can handle the X-Series more because, like, Whenever I play the original series, I'm just looking for a wall jump or a dash. Like, I, I think because yeah. I got so used to X series and because it fits more the way I like to play games, I think that's why I enjoy them so much but can't stand the original series. All right, because I'm kind of the opposite. Like, the X series, I think, you know, fine, it's enjoyable. But for me, the classic series is where I get most enjoyment. But I get where you're coming from. If you don't like platforming, then 
this game is basically platforming. And I mean, I, and the I, enemies really are just obstacles more than and anything. I, and I think the platforming is a lot more forgiving in the X series. It is. Oh, yeah, and that's, I was going to side with uh, Steven there as to why I prefer the X series over the Mega Man Classic. Is It is just a touch more forgiving in the platforming section because you had some of the most bonkers jumps in like Mega Man 2 and 3 where you had to recognize a pattern. Like they would show you like the famous one is the disappearing block section. Oh, yeah. And they'd give you the guidance and you'd get a safe area where it'd be like, okay, yeah, you see how this is going to work. And then they'll do it again, but they'll do it with kind of a uh, light trap, but no danger to you, but just kind of a light trap. We're like, oh, see, we'll throw something at you. And then suddenly you have to do it over a lava pit. Yeah. And it's like, once oh. you die eight times, you're kind of over it. Yeah, but then by that point, really, you should have the item that makes you fly over the gap. So yeah. you don't have to do the puzzle at all. Just screw it. I'm out of here. Yeah. The good thing is, though, Mega Man 8 does have, like, an invisible block section where they appear and then, you know, disappear. Mm -hmm. But it's only, like, for a small part, and it's not really that difficult, thankfully. Mega Man 8 is probably my favorite of the Mega Man classics. It's going to be that or Mega Man and Base. Really? I a really like... people don't like Mega Man and Base. I, the game is hard as hell. I think the problem with Mega Man and Base is is that there is a good game behind it, but they wanted to throw like lots of Mega Man One style bullshit, and I think that spoils it. To be honest, I think there's too many moments where you just feel like it really isn't fair, and that you never stood a chance. And I think it does put a damper on the experience. But like Eight's the complete opposite because Eight yeah. is not really that difficult. It's a extremely beautiful game. Oh, yeah. I mean, for me, it's the definitive Mega Man art style. Uh, you know, compared to, like, Mega Man 11 and, you know, the the NES style Mega Man. Mm -hmm. 7 and 8, and obviously base as well. 9 is, and 10, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much... Yeah. But, like, 7, 8, Mega Man and base, that's the definitive style for me. Mm -hmm. I think that's where Mega Man looks the best. Mega Man 8, the sprites are nice and big. They went to a huge color palette, and they picked nice, bright, vivid colors that fits the Mega Man art style so well. Yeah, and the enemies look great as well. The enemies look absolutely fantastic. They're just goofy enough to remind you that you're playing Mega Man and not Mega Man X. Yeah. The movement in the game is so fluid. And yeah. uh, bringing in, like you said, it has a bit of a story, but more important than that is the full motion video. Yeah. That they brought in for the story. This is actually an animated story in there well, based off of the same style. I think Mega Man 8 came after the Mega Man animated show, which was awful, came out. Super fighting robot. Mega <laughs> Man. But it was nice to see, and I like the character duo as well. Yeah, that FMV is interesting. I mean, I have the Japanese version, so thankfully when I play, I don't experience the voice acting. It's pretty bad. Um, it's Dr. not Why we? <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I'll give you that. I can't help but notice that Matt's been extraordinarily quiet. Yeah, I've been brooding. <laughs> <laughs> brooding. Okay, so let me tell you why this game can suck my entire cock. You know the... Um, <laughs> All the way to the bottom. <laughs> the phrase jump, jump, slide is now burned into my brain. I have <laughs> nightmares about that phrase. The, <laughs> the amount of times I heard that on the snowboard level, trying to just get through that level, just jump, jump, slide. And it's like, I'm pressing those buttons. Those are the buttons I'm pressing, but that is not what is happening right now. And just getting knocked off again and again and again. And well, just... that's actually something that I touched upon in my, you know, the review I did of it, and also a little bit at the start. Part of it's to do with, you know, the input delay from the PlayStation version, where it's just not tight enough for you to respond in time, because sometimes you press it, and you think that, you know, you pressed it on time, and you should be jumping, and it doesn't. And I find that only exists on the PlayStation version. And then the other thing is the voice acting. 
because the jump jump slide slide is very annoying. Yeah, but the Japanese right. version is a lot more subtle and it's never annoying. But when I played the English version, the English PlayStation version on the Switch, it was just like, wow, I can understand why people get annoyed by this. Especially with the input lag, meaning you have to repeat it again and again, hearing the same phrase. It's grating. But that particular level is basically the reason I stopped playing it. <laughs> I, I had gone through a few of the other levels before that. And again, as with most of the other Mega Man games that I've played, my hands start to hurt because I'm trying to keep the blaster powered up whilst jumping as well. And the way that my fingers have got to hold that and press jump at the same time, it just really, really starts to hurt my hands over time. Yeah. So I, I, It doesn't I, help on the Switch as well. I found that playing Mega Man games on the Switch, it can feel a little bit like your hands can get cramped because of how the buttons are. I didn't play this on Joy-Con. I played this on the 8-bit Do Pro Controller. Oh, okay. Which I got this month through the post. And Free advertising, y'all. It, 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 is, it is a fantastic controller, but it doesn't oh, have like, the issues like that it has. Is it like the one I'm currently holding in my hand? I cannot currently see you, but maybe. <laughs> he assumes that you're correct. Yeah. I'm it, think it, I'm it's, fu- it's the N30 model. Oh, I have the SF30 because I like the uh, color buttons. I think I'm going to shoot off a couple emails to Abitdo and see if they can sponsor us. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they'll do that. But yeah, my hands still hurt after doing that. And we've done Mega Man games in the past, and I've never really liked any of them particularly well. This wasn't really an exception. I just find them, like, way too difficult. And there's a specific reason that I mentioned the muted color palette in Panzer Dragoon, and that's because I knew this was coming up. The colors are really, really bright in this game. They've gone out of the way to make them really, really bright, and for me... I had trouble kind of working out what was going on on the screen a lot of the time because the background is the same vibrancy as the player characters and the creatures. So usually you have this kind of like middle ground where the background is a little bit muted and the sprites are a bit brighter just to help you distinguish those two. And in this game, they were pretty much exactly the same. And looking at that for a while, it just, it kind of set my eyes funny, and with the cramping in my hand as well, it just wasn't an enjoyable experience. But I mean, I think I kind of have a similar opinion to Steven in terms of the um, two different Mega Man series. Like, we've played, I think, this is the third game from the mainline Mega Man series that we've played on the podcast. And we also did... Mega Man X 2, was it? Mega Man X and X, Mega Man X, X 5. 4. X, X, X 2 yeah, and X 4, I believe. X, X 4. X 4, I think it's yeah. the one I'm uh, thinking of. Now, yeah. I got to the last boss in X 4. I couldn't even beat a single level in this. There is that kind of like, um, as Stephen mentioned, it is a lot more forgiving in the X series, at least the ones that I've played. These ones are just a bit too difficult for me even on, like, the toddler difficulty that the Switch allows you to put on. It well, just, with the Switch, um, it's only extra armor, mm-hmm. so it's not quite as easy as, like, the toddler difficulty in X4. But, yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. The X games are definitely a lot more forgiving in terms of the platforming because they know that the platforming is not the emphasis. It's the action. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and on this particular one, it is pretty much all about the platforming and the stupid ice boarding. And it's just not something that I can really get to grips with, as much as I've tried. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned about the ice boarding. That's one of the things that differentiates this from the other Mega Mans, is that the other Mega Man games in the main series, it's just platforming. Whereas this tries to do some different things, like... You've got the surfing sections, which are in that level, and then it returns later on in a much more difficult section, um, which I think is what a lot of people remember. I won't say fondly, but they remember the people who have played it. 
And there's also a shmup section, which I believe you've mentioned before that you have played it or you've seen it. No, I Did you get I, um, to the shmup bit of the level? I didn't, but I watched a video of some of the other levels just so I could see like a little bit more of the game. And I did see that shmup section and that, that looked fun. Like I so, said, I do enjoy shmups as a whole. I don't really enjoy platformers as a whole. And I wished I could have gotten to that shmup section, but I could not. All right. I thought you might have done, because it's maybe halfway through the level. I was having so much problems with the hand cramps and trying to figure out what was going on and the difficulty. I just didn't even get to any of the bosses. How far did you get on each level, then? Obviously, there's the snowboard section, which means you didn't get too far in that, and you didn't get to the shmup section in Tengu Man. What about the other two, the clown level and the grenade level? The clown level is where I actually started. That was the first level I tried. and um, I can see where you'd have problems with the foreground and background on that level. The start of that level, where there's all the toys and the worms going through, hmm. I think that's difficult to distinguish what's going on, and I just get hit. Just it's a bit of a confetti bomb. I think in the clown level, I just ended up getting... Um, chain fucked by the trains basically and i just kept getting hit over and over and over again by those little toy trains and (laughs) that was about as far as i got in that level tengu not particularly far obviously the ice boarding level i didn't get past that ice boarding section and the grenade level and i might not have gone onto the grenade level i'm it's not ringing a bell it's the one where you have the platforms and you stand on them and there's like a three-second detonator and then they explode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I played that one, but I think I saw a video of it. Okay. I only want to talk about one weapon in Mega Man 8 that is uh, unique and different and wacky enough from the rest of the Mega Mans, and that is the one you get right in the beginning where you kick a fucking ball. Yes, the soccer ball. It's not even a soccer ball. It's like a children's ball because it has a star on it, if I remember correctly, and like a big circle. And it's like purple and blue. Looks like the but, Pixar ball. Yeah, there you go. It's the it's the Pixar ball, but you just murder the shit out of stuff with it. Yeah, the rock ball's amazing because you fire it upwards and you can use it to hit at an angle. But you can also use it for platforming as well. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. You can continually jump on it. But not only just jumping on it while it's on the floor, you can jump up in the air and then kind of explode it in the air to kind of keep climbing infinitely. And it's a great trick, and it's the best thing ever. It's one of the reasons why I like the game so much. That ball was actually pretty much the only fun that I had in the game, just kicking that around at enemies. Yeah, there's actually quite a cool section later on in the final stage. There's a boss which you can only hit using the football, and you have to aim the football up and get it through like these tubes. And it's sort of like a a reverse whack-a-mole where you have to hit them from up top as it comes down, but with the football. And it's really cool. But like, there's quite a few useful weapons in this. Like, you have an electric whip as well, which you can use as a grappling hook. Like an ice weapon where it flies across the floor and just, you know, disintegrates everything. The weapons in this are really useful. Uh, I wouldn't know. I didn't really get to see much of the weapons in this one. What about the bosses? What did you think of the bosses? Um, I know you didn't get to them, Matt, but uh, Ryan, Stephen? Nope. No? No. Uh- The bosses seemed inconsistent. Maybe it's because I don't really know the pattern for them, whereas I know the pattern of a lot of other bosses in the Mega Man series. Series? Sirai? Is it a plural Sirai? It seemed like a lot of the bosses, the difficulty was fairly inconsistent, but um, design, I really liked it. I know I absolutely despise the Frostman stage, but I really like the design of the Frostman himself. The fight's really good, but one of my favorite things, and I remember this from the first time I played the game, he has a really, really goofy voice in the English. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to crush you. Yeah, like he he has two lines he can spit out when you start up the stage, and one is like, I am Frostman, and the other one just, even now if I hear it, 
I crack up because he's like, I will crush you. I will beat you. And it's just like. <laughs> Which is weird because he's quite an intimidating boss because he's, you know, like this really huge robot. He's super and big. And he's like. He's basically crushing like these blocks of ice and everything, and mm-hmm. you know, like there are ice statues of Mega Man in the boss room, and he basically crushes them with his fist, and he's like, oh, "I'm gonna crush you," <laughs> and it's like, hmm, that's oh. kind of ruined the atmosphere a bit. It's, uh, we call him Frost Man, but we all know his real name is Muggsy. Yeah, and they also introduced the first gay robot master, which is. Interesting. Do you know which one I'm talking about, Ryan? I think so. Aquaman. Um, so Aquaman, he's he's very flamboyant. Now it's not flamboyant in a Streets of Rage three kind of offensive way. He's just quite a, well. He's just slightly effeminate and he's very extravagant. And he fires rainbows from his from his water cannon. Yeah, and he's he, like, he, I'm Aquaman. I'm beautiful. <laughs> He has the top hat, right? Yes, he has the a top, top hat. The, the top hat looking head, yeah. But he's so fantastic because he's he's amazing. I mean, he's like a little tubby guy. So he's not like the most beautiful of all the Robot Masters. So he's not like, say, Mega Man 11. There's an ice skating Robot Master who's, you know, quite a handsome little robot. This is like, you know, a short, fat robot with a top hat. But he's dancing around and jumping around and firing rainbows out. And he's he's kind of cool. He's probably one of my favorite robot masters because his attacks are quite neat. And I think he's really cool. <laughs> um, one of my favorite bosses is a Tengu Man. Tengu Man, where he has an interesting weakness because he flies and the weapon that's strong against him goes against the ground. Mm -hmm. So you've got very few opportunities to actually hit him with it. So it makes him quite a challenging fight if you don't know what you're doing. He is a difficult boss, and I want to say, I might be thinking of a different one, but I want to say Tengu Man was also in Mega Man and Base? Yes, he was. He had a different attack plan. He did. He was a a different boss. And I also believe Tengu Man was in... um, Mega Man Power Fighters as one of the bosses you could come against. Uh, possibly. I've not played that. I think you'd really enjoy big, um, Power Battle and Power Fighters. It's uh, They're fantastic games. Yeah. So I think it's about time to wrap things up on Mega Man 8. I think that you enjoy it to an extent, Ryan. Am I right? It, it, I mean, it, it's not it, your my... favorite because I don't think you're as familiar with it as I am. It's my favorite of the classics. It's not my favorite of the really? Mega Man franchise. Well, I didn't think it'd be your favorite of the classics. I thought you'd prefer things like, you know, two or three or whatever, like That's, most it, people. It's probably going to be a toss-up on um, this or Mega Man and base. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, it's good to hear that you hold it in high regards. Uh, at least I've got one person on my team for Mega Man 8. <laughs> if it was um, possible to set fire to a digital purchase, then I would do. <laughs> <laughs> Harsh. No, you just being mean. <laughs> right, so in terms of me and Ryan, it's a, it's a solid game. And for you two, not so much. Nope. No. I only <laughs> have it because I had to have it to get the other ones. Fair enough. Right, well, I think it's time to move on to the final one. And the final one is an interesting pick, especially because it's coming from me. So we'll take a break and move on to the final game. So the final game we're covering is Dark Saviour. As I mentioned before, it's a little bit of an odd choice for me because it's sort of an RPG. I say it's an RPG, it's it's a very strange RPG, which I'll go into later. It was released in 1996 by a company called Climax Entertainment and is a sort of spiritual successor to the game Landstalker, if any of you guys ever played that. Yeah. I hadn't even heard of it until uh, I started researching for this one. 
You know, I've never played Landstalker either. I only heard about it after I played this game. But it's actually going to be released on the Sega Classics, which is I'm basically a week on the Switch. Right. So yeah, I'm probably going to play that as maybe the first game I play, or at least one of the earlier ones, just because of the link to it. But yeah, anyway, there's a game on the Mega Drive called Landstalker, and this is a spiritual successor to that. So it's an RPG, but it's in an isometric environment. And the combat is kind of like a fighting game. The combat is very infrequent in the game, but when it does crop up, it's basically a 1v1 fighter, even so much as it's like a three-round kind of affair where, you know, if you win one and they win one, there's a final one to work out who the champion is. Anyway, yeah, the story is not something I can really explain because of how the game works. I mean, the gist of it is you follow a bounty hunter called Garion, and his cargo is like this bad motherfucker called Bilan, and he's been escorted to Prison Island, and this guy escapes, and Garion needs to track him down. Or does he? It, yeah, or does. that's the thing. The story then diverges based on like how the initial part goes on, so, like, the one that most people will experience is that he escapes onto the island and then hell breaks loose. But then, for example, in the second parallel, which is the parallel I played through this time for the podcast, he doesn't escape and dies. So then the game plays out completely differently because it's, you know, it's what's going on on the island and it's got nothing to do with Billen because villain's dead we should point out as well when you say parallel that's like a different story yeah so you're playing basically a different game more or less i mean you'll still go to similar areas sometimes you'll go to areas that you've done experience in another parallel sometimes you go to the area but obviously things are different because different things have happened so you're kind of traversing it differently or just doing different things For example, there's a bit in the sewers where in the first parallel you spend a lot of time in the sewers, but in the second you just pass through them briefly to get to another area and you jump across like the top of the sewers and you jump across the railings and that's basically it. So things are kind of a lot different in each parallel. And think about how amazing that would have been back. When was this game released? Um... It was back in 1996. So yeah, 96. Back in 96, there weren't a whole lot of games that were doing something that drastic. Yeah. It wasn't unheard of. It wasn't I completely mean, unheard of, but it was still like a wow. Because like Chrono Trigger probably blew a whole lot of people's minds was that you can play through again. And there's yeah. like 16 different endings or something ridiculous. <laughs> it's worse than that. And, yeah, no, it's, 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 like, it's over 20 endings, I think. Yeah. But it's like, you know, oh, you can keep playing through on these game pluses and get farther and farther and get different endings. But think about someone who's playing Dark Savior. They play the game, they beat it, and then they go back through and they a experience month later, game. and they suddenly get a different game. Yeah, it's yeah. not just a different ending, it's a different game. And I love that mechanic. It's just, again, this is one that I didn't watch a whole lot because the idea fascinated me so much I wanted to play it. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, anyway, there's like a bunch of different parallels in the game based on the initial part, and they all fit together to give you an idea of what's going on with both Garion and the island. And I'm not going to spoil the overall plot arc and how it all fits together, yes, just in case don't. you know you all want to play it and experience everything together, but it's pretty good. And doesn't the um, variation where the story can shift, isn't it based off just how fast you can get through the uh, first segment? Yes, Mostly. Well, yeah. There are some variations where, you know, like, for example, if you lose the fight, then it will unlock another parallel. But mainly it's time-based. It's not the cheapest game, because I think to buy it, it's like maybe $40 or something, maybe. Maybe a little bit more. If you, I mean, for like Steven especially, who's into RPGs, I would say it's worth that price tag. Yeah, it is. I'm very interested in this game. And you say you, you're you calling it an RPG, but it almost isn't. Yeah, that's the weird thing. I mean, it's got, like, experience from battles, and you can level up. Mm-hmm. And it's also, you know, got, like, weapons and items and things. 
but the weapons are mainly based on progression. So you mm-hmm. get weapons, and it, lo- and and it looks like a lot of the progression or a lot of the gameplay is primarily almost a fast-paced platformer. You're either trying to puzzle yourself around a room to get out, or you're hauling ass across these maps. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's kind of weird because depending on the parallel, you kind of place it differently, like. The first parallel, there's a lot of platformings in this big temple, and you're solving all the temple puzzles. Whereas in the second parallel, you don't do any of the puzzles, and you don't have to do any of that. And the game's more story and RPG-based rather than platforming-based. So the game style kind of varies as well to varying degrees based on what parallel you're playing. And it's, Um, uh, like I said, 1996, absolutely brilliant. I mean, my gripe with it, and considering how groundbreaking it is, is only a minor gripe, is that it's based on something so minor as getting there in a certain amount of time, Mm -hmm. which seems very arbitrary. I kind of wish that the first level had other criteria that you have to fulfill. Like, I can imagine one of the parallels being based on time, you know, Billen can escape because he's planned his escape route effectively. But then, like other parallels, I think that maybe something else should affect it just to kind of make it feel a bit more of a natural split rather yeah. than just, like, get there a minute faster and it's a different parallel. It makes it more skill-based. So if you're physically unable to make that time, then you're kind of, like, missing out on a lot of the story. Well, I would say that it's very possible to get to parallel two because there's a shortcut and if you do the shortcut you don't have to be very good in order to hit the time limit so i think it's possible that you can play it through once just so you remember the rule then do it again and you've got it basically the Um, second parallel is easy enough but the final one final one's like two and a half minutes or something or something stupid and you really really have to haul ass for that because I thought when I got the second parallel that getting the next one's going to be really hard. I don't want to uh, spoil because again, this is such an interesting game. It actually does have an interesting story. I I kind of sort I want to play. I want to pick it up eventually. Uh, I did sit down and watch the entire game. Just I the it all. entire game. I just all watched the parallels play- or just I the wa- first parallel. I think it was the uh, second parallel. So is that the one with the minecart ride? Yes. Yeah. That's the uh, second parallel. I watched the I watched a playthrough of that whole thing. Nice. I didn't intend to. I'm like, I want to get a feel of this, maybe watch some of the battles and get an idea of what's going on. And I was just like, no, this is fascinating. But the story is very interesting. But the thing that I, gets me about the story is that there's not much to it. The story is very simple and very condensed. But there's like so much stuff about the world, and each parallel contains more story and different things that it all kind of builds up as you play more of the game, so that as you're playing more and more parallels, you're getting this full knowledge of how the island is and how this world is and how everything fits together. It is a fascinating world that they've actually built. I thought um, one of my favorite things, more based on the story, except it's not even that, it's more based on localization, was the jalapeno juice. Oh, and yes. Did you I, read I up didn't... about what happened with that? Yeah, like, I looked at, like, I it, I sat there and thought, I'm like, what the hell? I'm drinking jalapeno juice. I'm like, wait a minute. So I double-checked, like, okay, so yeah, it was censored. Yes. It was censored. It was, it's, you didn't drink jalapeno juice. He got wasted. <laughs> yeah. There's quite a lot of censoring. Like, it included stuff like porno mags and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Cigarettes. Uh, cigarettes which you use in order to buy things rather than chocolate mm-hmm. and obviously jalapeno juice is alcohol yeah which, uh, which is extra funny because it's like oh yeah you got this like you said you have this, this uh, strong badass. jalapeno juice and now everything's going crazy you have this yeah you have this <laughs> badass motherfucker and then suddenly you're drinking jalapeno juice and your the economy is based on chocolate <laughs> To be fair, I don't think the other things matter so much because things like, you know, the whole thing based on chocolate is just like, fine, it's a video game world. Exactly. And I think the jalapeno juice, I think it's obvious that it's supposed to be alcohol, that it doesn't really affect things because you know what's going on. 
you know that he's getting wasted. It could be fermented jalapeno juice. The thing is, the fact that that's alcohol is quite important to the overall story. But yeah, I won't say much more than that. Because I did just assume that it was like some really strong chili juice. It's kind of funny because it's kind of like um, the old Dumbo cartoon versus the more updated one where they edited it. In the old one, champagne gets dumped in the bucket and the mouse and Dumbo get wasted. And then you have the horror fest that is Pink Elephants on Parade. Yeah. And then in the updated one, it wasn't champagne. It was soda. So it's supposed to be a sugar rush. Yeah, I I don't know. It, it, It makes no sense, but they didn't want alcohol in there. Right. But they left the pink elephants on parade bit like, OK, either acknowledge that, that champagne exists in the world or just scar yeah. children. <laughs> Take your pick. <laughs> but, yeah, when you have an edit like that, you're like, hmm. Oh, like uh, like an E.T. Oh, yeah. Where they replaced all the guns with radios. Yeah, because they wanted a lower rating than PG. <laughs> that was a funny edit. Anyway, off topic, but. As I said before, like. I quite like that the story is very kind of uh, tight and that, you know, it's a very focused story as well. It doesn't bog everything down with dialogue. You do get dialogue and stuff, but it's very kind of to the point. And the story is more about the overarching mystery with what's going on with Garion and what's going on with the island. And it doesn't overcomplicate things. And I really appreciate that because the story in RPGs generally turns me off a little bit because usually they're overcomplicated they're talking forever and and i just get sick of it and it seems like everything about this game is very compact the story i mean like the combat in the game very rarely do you actually get into fights and the experience you can get experience to level up but you can beat the game without even leveling up because you have to level up through a menu And you'll probably level up maybe two times throughout the course of the game, which gives you an extra, what, 10 health or something. So it's completely unnecessary, but it's there. So it really is like an RPG super light, because the RPG stuff barely matters. And I think that's the reason why I like it. Well, I mean, yeah, if someone who doesn't like RPGs, then the lighter RPG elements would work for you, just like Mega Man X for me. Yeah. The lighter and, platforming is more attractive. And the good thing as well is that the game is quite short because it'll take you maybe about five hours to beat a parallel. But, you know, you've got multiple parallels. So over the course of all the parallel, then it's going to be a decent sized game. But it doesn't overstate its welcome. You can beat a parallel and be done with it in like five hours. And you're like, OK, that was good. I'll wait until, like, another year, and then I'll play through the second one, for example. It doesn't require you to spend, you know, a ridiculous amount of time investing in this one game, which, now that I'm older, I kind of appreciate that, because, you know... We got jobs. Settling down with, like, a... Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Settling down with one game for a long period of time can be a big investment, um, I want to backpedal because you started off by saying it's an isometric. The game is isometric, and it is. Yeah. But the rooms, you can shift the camera a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, there's so, like to, rudimentary to, camera control. Yeah, there's rudimentary, I mean, you know, like it snaps back to your thing, but you can kind of move the camera a little bit to kind of see what's in the room because the problem with, um, especially yeah. in the very first zone, you can see it's just hard to see stuff because it's isolated. You know, you're locked in this isometric view, except you're not. <laughs> But you can so pan the camera a little bit. Yeah, you can see this. Just scooch around the camera a little bit so you can kind of see what's going on if there's something hidden around the corner or just to kind of get a better idea of where you're standing. And yeah. that was another really brilliant maneuver just to just to assist, but without having to go and like create um, an actual three full 3D camera yeah. with 3D environments. Because obviously that would have been a real intensive thing um, to do. Yeah, that yeah. would have been an intense endeavor. It's still an isometric game, so but yeah, but it still, still takes a lot of getting used. The game generally has respect for the player in terms of isometric gameplay. Things like the camera and the movement, you can move mid-jump as well to kind of negotiate where you're landing a bit more. So you can even move like in 90-degree angles, so you can jump around things. 
And it seems like the game realizes that platforming isn't the easiest from that standpoint, and it does things to help you. And I think that's really good. I mean, there's modern games like, uh, I don't know if you've ever played Luma. It was a modern isometric game that was released like, I don't know, whenever it was, a few years back. That game is very obnoxious with isometric. It knows it's difficult and it tries to be difficult because of it. Hides things with the view. Yeah. And it kind of feels like that's unfair and obnoxious. But in this, it kind of feels a bit fairer. It's still difficult, but the game's trying to do what it can to assist you. I kind of appreciate that. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's kind of like how uh, in Diablo, it's designed in such a way that anything can be seen from that isometric view. Like, you're not going to miss something because of the camera angle. Yeah. Well, and like I was saying, the opposite direction, uh, Super Mario RPG is isometric. But it's still, because it's a Mario game, they still slip in platforming here and there. And it's usually not too bad, but there's a couple sections where it can um, be. Where just, it's like, yeah, you if you want to go get this thing or get through this really short puzzle, the isometric view is just a bastard. Which is a problem with the genre, I guess. Yeah, and it's I just like... I've played many isometric games, which handle really well. And it's just the problem of what it is. I mean, it's like, it's not a bad game, but every once in a while you're just like, son of a bitch. It's like when the Halo games try to say, you know, we want you to platform now. Yeah. No, that's not what the games are. Don't make me do this thing. (laughs) My one gripe about the game actually is the isometric platforming. I mean, I guess you guys find it a little bit easier than I did because I had a lot of problems with a lot of the sections just telling where stuff was and the exact angle I was trying to jump with. I mean, I know you can adjust the camera around a little bit, but to me, even with that, especially... The sections with the girders that you've got to walk on top of and yeah. places like that and like make fairly accurate jumps. For me, the isometric view just really, really hindered that for me. I still enjoyed the rest of the game. I enjoyed the puzzle aspects. I enjoyed the combat, the story, the world building, stuff like that. But the, the isometric um, platforming. Yeah, the isometric platforming just really frustrated me especially the parts in the game where if you fall or land in water, you can sometimes go quite far back. Yeah, I find that the probably the first parallel is the most difficult in that regard because it does take a lot of getting used to. And I found that even towards the end of the first parallel, I was still struggling in parts. But then when I replayed through and did the second parallel... I found that I had a much easier time because I had already been through the game and got through all the challenges that doing similar type things in the, you know, the different parallel, it was a lot easier for me to adjust to and I was kind of a bit more used to it. So it is something you do kind of adapt to, but it's isometric platforming, so it's not the easiest. But I think that this game compared to a lot of other isometric games definitely does it quite well but i do appreciate that it is not the easiest thing to do what about the art style what do you think about the look of the game i actually liked it i thought it looked uh pretty nice i found a unique art style and i I quite enjoyed it too the sprite works really good no I, i will say the sprites are nice i found it a little funny though that you know they have kind of this uh i would just call it a serious tone the game has kind of a serious tone visually yeah, but they show um, what's his name? Your big bad villain who's in the cage, and he's this bright ass motherfucker. But then it's kind of weird because the look of the game is a little bit more serious, as you say. But then the game does have very cartoony elements, like the fact that you're picking up huge bars of chocolate to you know pay for things. But then some of the things that happen, like the guy that's in charge of the prison, uh, Kurt. The prison warden is, he's like a cartoonish villain. And, you know, some of the things that happen, like the scene in the town when you first get to the prison area, when you take the jalapeno juice, I mean, that section is weird and silly. And I kind of think the game sort of 
takes itself seriously, but sort of doesn't. And it's, I think it's kind of playing on that tone that it's trying to give the appearance of a serious RPG whilst also being quite light-hearted. I mean, in that particular scene, you do almost kill a child. So not like terribly light-hearted. Well, that made me laugh so much because like, (laughs) not because you almost killed a child, but because, um, you know, when you go into a battle, you have that versus screen where it shows the pictures of you and your opponent. Yeah. And then it just says, like, Garion versus Boy. <laughs> it goes into the battle music. But, yeah, it's interesting. I do quite like the look of it. And the music, too. I know you're not a fan of the music, Matt, but I quite like the music. Yeah, I mean, I listened to some of it back, and it just isn't particularly engaging to me, personally, the music. No. I found some of it very good. I mean, there's some tracks that aren't as good as others, but then the like really good tracks, I think, are really good. Like the one that I picked for the opening to this game, I like quite a lot. And there's also another one in the mansion, which I think is really good. And, you know, a few other tracks dotted here and there, which I think are like really good music tracks. And some of my favorite music tracks on the Saturn. The one track that I did like is the track that plays whenever you see the boss of the island. You know, when you're in that lab. Yeah, that music's good. Yeah, I couldn't say, you know, definitely what parts of the game the music I heard is from because I just looked up some of the music. But, I mean, I thought it was, you know, quite good. I also thought it was, um, I don't know, I guess I, the word I would describe it was fitting. It wasn't like anything that, like, stood out to me. I didn't find any of the tracks to be like, wow, this is super memorable. But I also didn't find any of the music to drone on, and I've had that happen more than I've had music like stand out to me. And Dark Savior didn't do either of those things. Yeah, and yeah, then there's nothing worse than having a song that just goes like, "Oh my god, I don't want to be in here anymore. I don't want to be in this section. I don't want to be in this zone because the music is grating." As you know, similar things we talked about, jump, jump, slide. <laughs> but I wouldn't say any of the tracks were like, "Oh my god." So stand out, yeah. Oh, so bad. Yeah. Well, I quite enjoy it. And I quite enjoy the game a lot that I want to play all the games in the series. Like, even though it's not a continuous storyline, there's games that are quite similar. Like I mentioned Landstalker before. There was also Lady Stalker, which I think was on the SNES, which has a terrible title. I mean, yeah. they released a game called Lady Stalker. And... Yeah, it was I don't think that's the best title for it. And it was also, I think it's called Alundra on the PlayStation. And I think that was a spiritual successor too. I did do a little bit of research and Alundra was connected to this series. Yeah, I couldn't quite remember the name, but I'm sure it was Alundra. So yeah, I thought it was right. But yeah, I'm very interested to play those other three games just to kind of experience it. I know it's not the same story, but... I had a good time with this, and I definitely want to experience more. The uh, Dreamcast also had a game in the series. Yeah? Uh, Time Stalkers. Really? So, it's weird because technically um, Dark Savior isn't connected to the series at all. It isn't connected to the Landstalker series. Yeah, I think it's just a spiritual success. Yeah, it, it's a, I think it's a it's similar in... game, but it's just it has no relation at all. I thought it was in the same world, but like a completely different... As far as for what, when I was uh, reading up on it, it has no connection. All right. I know that it's a very kind of self-contained story, and it's not something that even playing the others would make any difference to, apart from, you know, maybe being used to the isometric platforming, I suppose. What's a shame is if somebody hadn't already gotten to the name, they could have used uh, a game called Dark Stalkers to bridge the two. Yeah, true. Right. Whoops. One of the biggest shames, I think, is that this game never saw release anywhere else. It was a Saturn exclusive and has remained a Saturn exclusive. And I think that's a shame because it would have been good if they'd have released it like later, um, either as part of a collection or just on other consoles. You know, because of the nature of the Saturn and how unpopular it was at the time. It's made it a little bit of a rarer commodity these days. As I say, it's not amazingly high in price, and I definitely think it's worth the price it goes for. 
because it's still cheaper than like a you know a modern game today because it's you know what, forty dollars or something. But you know, it's kind of a shame that more people can't play this game. I paid thirty five pounds, which is generally more than I would have liked to have paid. I did originally try to emulate it on three different Saturn emulators, and it no just luck. wasn't having it. Yeah, so I just had to buy it. Yeah, I had the same thing. I couldn't even get Dark Savior to um, boot up if I uh, mounted the game and tried to fire it up. It just crashed. Like yeah. literally locked at my desktop. I got the title screen, but as soon as the demo started to play and anything after that, the screen was just black. What a shame. This will probably be the first game I pick up when I get a Saturn. Oh, that's good to hear. Right, well, I think that will lead us nicely into the final section. We'll take one final break and we'll talk about our picks for this month. Okay, so that's the four games we covered this time. We had Secundo Arakatoa Sandoaru, uh, Puzzle Action. We had Mega Man 8, Panzer Dragoon, and Dark Savior. So, which did you prefer? Uh, we'll start with you, Matt. Which did you like the best out of the four? Out of the four, I definitely prefer Puzzle and Action. I thought that Panzer Dragoon was decent enough. I really quite enjoyed Dark Savior. But Puzzle Action, it immediately became like one of the best games that I owned for the Saturn. I would say the second best game after Resident Evil for me. It's just stupid and fun. And yeah. sometimes you don't want like a deep, serious experience. You just want to jump into something and just play something like super dumb for a little bit. And that's a good thing. You can just kind of jump in and out of the game. Yeah. And you can go in for like five minutes, or you can go in for like an hour and still have a good time. Yeah, definitely. Okay, what about you two? For me, hands down, is Dark Savior just on premise alone. It's just so fascinating to me to see that mechanic so utilized in that way that I, I've never seen it before. And, you know, I'm a big fan of games with branching narrative and all that, and it's this is a new one for me. I'm going to roll in right behind Steven with the same thing. Even though I didn't get to play it, obviously I didn't get, really get to play any of these other than Mega Man 8 and about 60 seconds of uh, Panzer Dragoon before that crashed. Dark Savior just utterly fascinated me in its uh, parallel system, in visually it's appealing... It does have the splash of humor. It has the splash of um, seriousness. The combat is as sparse as it's very... It's unique for a game like this. Yeah, it's and, very uh, I want, And I definitely want to experience this one-of-a-kind type of game. That's good to hear. Well, for me, as I was saying, Mega Man 8 is like one of my favorite games on the system, so I'd have to pick that. And if I had to choose a second, um, I'd probably be agreeing with all three of you. I think it would be a joint between Dark Savior and Secundo Arakatoa, just because I like them both for very different reasons, and I think they're both really enjoyable. So we're all winners. Hooray! Apart from Panzer Dragoon, they didn't get chosen at all. Except Mega Man 8. No, I like Mega Man 8. Someone here doesn't. Mm. Uh, well, yeah, true. Right, okay, well, I think that wraps up this Saturn special. So, thanks a lot, you guys. It's going to be the Christmas special next. We have some festive treats lined up. That'll be fun. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah. And it's also the end of the year, so we'll be choosing our favourite games that we've played this year. I know Matt's game will be Mega Man 8, for sure. <laughs> Honestly, I think three of us will have the same answer. Uh, yeah, I kind of have the feeling. I'm going to go back to brooding. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll see. Okay, well, thanks for everybody for listening, and we'll see you next month. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>